one of the most interesting topics uh, to wrap your head around as uh, we continue to develop artificial intelligence and autonomous systems in general are systems that without any humor, human intervention are programmed to go in and kill stuff. So uh, Rebecca, can you kind of give us the lay of the land uh, where things stand with those kinds of technologies right now and how the world is grappling with regulating them? Sure. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for not starting off with a picture of the Terminator, because that is what <laughs> everybody immediately goes to when I say I work on killer robots. Um, so things to wrap your heads about around autonomous weapon systems in terms of what they are. First of all, they're not drones. Um, most people think that when I talk about autonomous weapon systems, I'm just talking about drones. But drones are actually semi-autonomous weapon systems insofar as there's a human being who's making decisions about selecting and engaging targets. They're just doing it remotely, uh, you know, with some geographic and sometimes a slight temporal distance. Meanwhile, they're also not landmines. Uh, landmines are geographically separated from the human deployer and they act independently, but they act in a very automatic way. Autonomous weapon systems, in contrast to both of these uh, sort of common uh, or at least conventional weapons, existing weapons, uh, have the capability of independently selecting and engaging targets. And in terms of the debate right now, there's some debate as to whether or not autonomous weapon systems already exist. Uh, there's a lot of people who are arguing that they're weapons of the future, but that they're coming soon. They're going to be here in 10 to 20 years, uh, possibly even five years. Uh, there's also people like me who argue that we already have autonomous weapon systems that are being deployed. They're not always being used in their fully autonomous modes, but they nonetheless have they have that fundamental capability of independently selecting and engaging targets. And so one example, just to make things concrete, uh, the SGRA-1 is a stationary armed robot that's used to patrol, well, it's stationary, but it's used to monitor uh, the Korean demilitarized zone. And it uses, I believe it's actually, you know, Connect uh, technology, PlayStation technology, to identify human forms and train a gun on them, order them to halt and surrender. And South Korea maintains that these uh, robotic systems are being used in conjunction with human operators. So they're being used in a semi-autonomous autonomous mode. But the manufacturer has, are, has also said that they have an autonomous mode where they wouldn't need a human operator in which they could independently identify a human being and uh, engage it. Wow. So is the is the analogy kind of like uh, the autopilots that fly all the commercial planes uh, in our skies today that um, technically they can do everything that a pilot would need to do, but but the pilot is there for oversight and emergency purposes. Are they operating sort of along those lines? Yeah, I would call the autonomous weapon systems that are in use today uh, human supervised autonomous weapon systems. And this follows the U.S. Department of Defense terminology in one of their direct policy directives on autonomous weapon systems, where they basically say that human supervised autonomous weapon systems are in use today. And wow. apologies to all my pilot friends that uh, I just called you unnecessary. That's not what I meant at all. <laughs> 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 Apologies to Rebecca too. That right before I uh, huh. began the show, we did we did not flash up a graphic of the Terminator, but I did tweet, "Come with us if you want to live." So <laughs> I am definitely I, guilty. I wrote and then deleted two different tweets that were both like, "I you know I for one look forward to talking about our robot overlords tomorrow." <laughs> but there we go. I like that one too. All right, Rebecca. Um, so we have some of these systems in place in the world today in a supervised kind of capacity. Um, who was it you just mentioned who said that such things must be supervised? Um, so the Department of Defense has a policy, US Department of Defense has a policy directive saying that 
there are human super that it's okay to have human supervised autonomous weapon systems. Uh, there's also a large debate about what that actually is going to entail, what's going to constitute sufficient supervision, um, what the sort of jargon of the moment is, what is meaningful human control and uh there's a lot of variations on what control means and on what meaningful means. Uh, some states would say that there needs to be a human in the loop actively making the decision every time there's uh, a decision to select and engage a target to use lethal force against another human being. Other states would argue that having a human on the loop, just sort of monitoring the system with veto power, that would be, mm. constitute sufficient human control, meaningful human control. And still other states are sort of arguing that, you know, as if a human wrote the program and a human incorporated sufficient rules into the program that's directing the autonomous weapon system, that that is actually sufficient, meaningful human control. Okay, so we don't have agreement on that front. And, and you mentioned it's the Department of Defense who the United States Department of Defense, who who has said, well, we have to have some sort of human oversight, uh, then we can get into the weeds of what that means. Um, how does the U.S. Defense Department's policy translate into what other countries will do? Right, yeah. Well, the great thing about the U.S. policy is that it's public. Uh, as far as mm -hmm. I know, and I could say this with more assurance about six months ago, uh, it is the only public policy on a, a state's use of autonomous weapon systems. Uh, I think Britain is sort of the UK is the next up in terms of they've they've published some policy related to autonomous weapon systems and they've come out explicitly against a ban on all autonomous weapon systems. As far as I know, they're the only state that's done that so far. Hmm. But really, it's the only public state policy, military policy on autonomous weapon systems. And so I think it's just going to be huge. It's definitely been hugely influential in the academic discourse uh, in terms of informing how states are thinking about these systems. And I think it, it's likely to be influential for other states that maybe weren't thinking about what their policies were even going to be yet. So the uh, Korea example that you gave earlier, they haven't uh, said anything about their use of these maybe autonomous robots besides that they may or may not have a human attached to them at some point? <laughs> They've said that they are human supervised, that they don't operate in an autonomous mode. And that's that's pretty much the extent of it. Huh. I think there is, a, this is completely separate and uh, tangential. I think there might be a, a South Korean uh, call for a code of robot ethics. Um, so that may or may not be related. I, I mm -hmm. don't think that's a military code. <laughs> <laughs> right. Huh. This is so fascinating. I I have so many questions, but I know that we're talking about this in sort of an international state warfare context. And I'm remembering at the same time the you know, textbook case from Torts, uh, one about trap guns. Um, I don't even know right. how to frame well, this question. This is so crazy. Well, like, first, where while you're like, framing, let's yeah. remind <laughs> Let's remind our non-lawyer uh, listeners what that textbook case was. And and this is the thing that um, uh, everybody learns in torts in law school. And, and torts is one of Rebecca's specialties as well. And that torts is um, liability, uh, non-criminal liability for harming people in a physical way. Um, so when they're, and, and also it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, harm to people, uh, but Again, we won't get too far down the road there. Um, what Emery is referring to is the situation where in an effort to defend one, one's property, um, someone has set up an automated gun. Uh, typically, you know, if I'm remembering the facts of the trap gun case, right, I think it was in the garage. Yeah. And uh, if, the, if the door is opened, uh, the gun goes off. It's set up just to fire, you know, the landmine example that Rebecca gave earlier, except this time it's a gun pointed out the door. And um, this is a case that uh, every law student studies and, and it's a 
classic um, example of how, you know, no, you can't do that. Yes, you're going to be responsible if you injure somebody with this sort of defense mechanism uh, at your house. So um, have I filled enough to give you time to frame your question, Emery? Yeah, yeah, I think so. So, I mean, for all of our non-legal experts out there, and I mean, actually anyone can probably understand that the importance there is that uh, in the, the trap gun case, there's no one that could um, veto that power to, you know, kill someone. Um, that if it happened, if, you know, the condition is met, then the gun fires and kills someone regardless of whether or not a human has any input in that. I know that, Rebecca, you've worked a lot or you've written about the idea of war torts. I was sort of under the impression, I guess, I don't know anything about uh, international war law, um, but I was sort of under the, under the impression that every nation basically respected that idea, that you want to have a person behind the trigger. Um, but I guess clearly I, I was incorrect. Uh, at least Britain has not um, as allow or said that they would outright ban autonomous weapons. I guess I, I want to just put that over to you. Do you want to give our listeners a little bit of background about war torts and sort of how uh, this works into that discussion? Sure. <laughs> trying to distill that. So yeah, autonomous sorry about weapons. That. <laughs> no, no, it's it's a great question. Uh, two things to go down on. Uh, first is the law of armed conflict obviously allows for the killing of people. It just allows for the killing of some people and not others. So there are lawful targets. There are combatants are lawful targets, civilians who are directly participating in hostilities, right? People who take up guns and, and, and fight the enemy forces are lawful targets. Um, and there are lawful objects that can be targeted, uh, just military objectives. There's also unlawful targets. So that would be civilians, um, wounded or um, surrendering soldiers are unlawful targets and civilian objects. And civilian objects include a host of different things from hospitals to museums to livestock, et cetera. And the whole aim, I think, uh, of the law of armed conflict, also known as international humanitarian law, is to minimize the harm and minimize the the to those unlawful targets and make sure that militaries only use force against lawful targets. And there are a host of subsidiary rules that autonomous weapon systems challenge in different ways. One of the issues raised by autonomous weapon system is, is who do you hold accountable when an autonomous weapon system commits a serious violation of international humanitarian law? These serious violations usually are committed by human beings and they're called war crimes when they're committed mm -hmm. by a human being because a person has to act with intention or with recklessness to commit a war crime. But you can imagine a situation where an autonomous weapon system, because of its capability for independent action, takes some action that would constitute a serious violation of international humanitarian law, but Nobody along the line from the programmer to the developer to the manufacturer to the commander to the deployer, no person acted willfully, which is to say with the intention of causing that violation or uh, recklessly, you know, acting notwithstanding knowledge of the, uh, the likelihood of the consequences. And in that very hard case, there's no one who can be held accountable under existing international humanitarian law, international criminal law, rather. There's no um, individual criminal liability when there's no willful action. And so I make the argument in my word towards piece that we need to, that this is a, an issue that's highlighted by autonomous weapon systems, this possibility of serious violations where nobody acts willfully. And we need a new legal regime to address when this happens. And autonomous weapon systems highlight you know, that it happens, but it also happens in other situations. I think there's a case to be made that things like the bomb bombing of the, um, the Doctors Without Borders Hospital might constitute a war tort, if not a war crime, insofar as it was found that nobody acted, you know, the US found in their investigation that nobody acted with intention and nobody acted recklessly. They attribute it to some technological errors. And I think that's a case, there's a case to be made that that's a war tort and that the need for war tort, there's a need for war torts uh, to minimize uh, 
these actions that are otherwise there's no accountability for them and also to provide compensation to the victims of those actions, which is part of the point of tort law, both minimizing on the front end and providing compensation on the back end. Um, Going back to your, your, your original tort case example, and this is where I say the law of war allows for killings. There are such things as landmines, right? There are such things Mm -hmm. as tripwire sentry guns and that, Right. Depending on how those are used, depending on how those are deployed, depending on whether they're anti-personnel or anti-tank, they can be lawful under the law of war. Um, so it's it's not you know domestic law, which presumes that killing another person is is likely unlawful. It's quite the opposite in the law of war. 